Let's consider the harder thing. What about discriminating one face from another? This is a particularly interesting question because actually just the plain acuity of infant vision is really low. Stuff is super blurry to infants. So you might think, how could they possibly discriminate one face for another? Um, but actually, um, there's some experiments that get at this. So first we need to do a sidebar on how would you ask an infant what they can see or what they can discriminate, okay? Can't, well, you can ask them, but they won't understand what you're asking, right? So you have to be smart. And the particular version of smart is due to the amazing Liz Spelke, who I mentioned last time. I was dissing her view that language is how you get out of an informational encapsulation, but she's brilliant in many different ways, including having invented, not invented, other people had done this, but she's the one who saw the power of this method and created a whole infant, a whole uh, field of infant development, which has really given us this incredible view that uh, very young infants know a huge amount. Okay, so let me just give you the basics of the method. Okay, so um, what, um, what she and uh, her then student Phil Kelman wanted to know is what does an infant see um, um, in this situation? Okay, so if you see this, like even if you didn't know that was a pen, what do you see? Would you infer that that's a single object? Actually, let me do this. That's not the right way to do it. Get with a program, okay, I'm sure. Okay, this is, this is a better way to do it. Okay. What you guys presumably see is an occluder and an object moving behind it. But notice that the, sense stimuli, the sensory stimuli that reached your eyes were just as compatible with two little bits moving back and forth, right? Okay, so this is part of the problem of induction, the ill-posed nature of vision that I've been talking about this whole course and much of perception. It could have been just two little bits, but you guys inferred one thing, okay? So Kalman and Spelke wanted to know, do infants also infer that there's one thing in that situation? Here's how they did it. They showed that display with a, a moving bar behind a box, um, and they asked whether the infants see this or this, okay? How do they do that? Well, what they do is they sit the infant on a parent's lap facing a screen, okay? And they show the, the infant a whole bunch of instances of this, okay? And they keep track of how long does the infant watch that display before they look away. That's looking time. How long do they look before they get bored? And what you find is if you do that over repeated trials, they look less and less and less long. They're getting bored with this thing. Been there, done that. Stop bothering me with your stupid stimulus, right? Okay, natural. But now notice how this is empowering because the infants are looking less long because presumably it's the same thing. We can use that to ask, what do you think is the same, little infant? What is the same? So after they get bored, you then show them either that or that and you ask which one they're bored with. No box, just that or that, okay? And what you find is when you show them the complete item, this one here, that's the, the dark line there, they are still bored. That means they think it's the same thing. Whereas if you show them the broken one, they start paying attention again, something new. So that tells you that what the infant had inferred when they were looking at this is that it was one solid line. That's why they got bored when you changed it to two bits rather than one. Everybody get this idea? It's really simple, but really powerful. Yes? So I don't know what, what the test yeah, okay, so they, they do a few trials. It's really hard to get infants in the lab, and so they do, and this is the cleanest data right there, but then while you have the kid there, you do a couple trials. I never know what to make of those, but to me, that's the strongest data is on the first trial. Okay, make sense? Okay, so that's the basis of the whole kind of revolution in our understanding of infant perception and cognition that's happened in the last 20 years. And it's super exciting. And if you like this stuff, you, could, you should take Laura Schultz's class. It's amazing. Okay, but for present purposes, um, we're asking this question about how, how well uh, newborn infants can do face discrimination. And we're gonna use this habituation of looking time method. 
Okay, so there's a lab in Italy uh, next to a maternity ward, and they have done just an amazing series of experiments characterizing what infants can do with faces when they're newborn, one to three day old infants. Okay, so in one experiment, infants are habituated to stimuli like this, a f photograph of a front view of a face, no hair. Okay, so same deal, you present it a bunch of times, you measure how long the infant looks before they get bored and look away, and then you present something new and you ask if they see the difference, okay? So in this experiment, they habituated kids with a front view and then they tested them with a three-quarter view like this, and this is the same person, as, this is a different person, and one to three day old infants are more habituated to this than that. That is, they look longer at this item, which is a new face, than at that one that's a different face. One to three days old, terrible, crappy, blurry vision. They can still do this, it's not hair, there's no hair. Amazing, right? And it's at least partially viewpoint invariant, right? They got bored to this and we're habituated to that. That tells us that what, got, what they got bored to is not the position of pixels in this image, right? It's some more abstract representation of the face. That's why it transferred from this to that. Everybody got that? Very powerful, very surprising. I think it's surprising. Okay, okay, um, all right. So that suggests they recognize the identity of that person. These are for novel faces they haven't seen before. They're similar looking faces. Uh, they don't have hair and they've done it across viewpoint changes. Wow, bravo little infants. Okay, um, next, um, what do we have next? Okay, right, if you switch all the way from a view like this to a full profile view, they can't do it. Okay, so there are limits to their viewpoint invariance, but that's not too surprising. We're not so great at that either, actually, us adults. Right, so here they also can't discriminate from a three-quarter view from a profile view. It's like the profile view is hard, right? It's not just the angular distance from the habituation thing, just the profile view is hard. But down here, it's always the same person and they're asked to discriminate front view from, uh, from three-quarter view and they can discriminate orientation if that's the only thing that changes. Okay, so that's just to show you um, that they can do pretty abstract um, um, it, generalization of face identity, but this doesn't tell us what cues they're using to do this. It's impressive, but how are they doing this? Okay. Maybe they're doing it on the basis of simple visual features that are similar enough across these viewpoint changes. Maybe not the pixels, but some other simple thing. Or maybe they're using something higher level. So these are empirical questions. You find more infants, you test different things. These guys did all this stuff. And they show that here they replicate the result in a full face depiction. They get greater habituation to the same face than a different face. If they use just the internal features, they get the same thing, okay? Habituation to the same face versus the other face, so it's not hair, that's just replicating what we saw before. But if you get rid of the internal features, oh, if you get rid of the internal features, they will also habituate to the hair, okay? So they can use either the internal features or the external features. Um, however, if you do the whole experiment with inverted faces, then they can only, um, they only habituate uh, to the outer features, the hair, not to the inner features of the face, okay? So does everybody see how that tantalizingly suggests that what's going on here bears some resemblance to the specific adult face recognition system that we spent all that time talking about that has these particular hallmarks? It looks like one hallmark is present in the first few days of life. That's pretty suggestive. However, as promised, I'm going to keep throwing out these little tantalizing little things that seem like an answer and then I'm going to knock them down. I still like this. It's suggestive. It's a pretty weak effect statistically, which is one issue. But the bigger problem is, um, it, you know, so the point of this is it seems like that can't be carried out by a generic system. Otherwise, it should work just as well for inverted faces. The problem is that um, I actually wrote to the authors who seem to be taking this very empiricist view and I'm like, but wait a minute, you guys have the strongest data I have ever seen for an innate face recognition ability because you get it upright, not inverted. And they wrote back to me and they said, well, actually, the habituation time that it takes, that boredom curve, um, 
is um, much faster with the inverted faces than the upright faces. And therefore, the fact that they don't habituate in the same way may be just that they, the habituation didn't function the same way. So this is tantalizing, but the authors themselves don't believe this conclusion that this demonstrates this face-specific ability. So yet again, we have a, we're left in this kind of frustrating situation, tantalizing but ultimately unresolved. Okay. Okay. And by the way, I, I don't mean to be like freaking you out with a million details. I want you to understand the logic by which these experiments are done, how you ask these questions, and the basic findings that recur again and again and again. You should encode, hopefully, but I'm not going to ask you very obscure things about one of these studies in particular. Okay? Okay. All right. So, ability to discriminate one individual face from another is present very early. Across viewpoint changes, um, there are inversion effects. Um, and um, all this has, uh, yeah, the, this, the composite effect has been shown in three-month-old infants, not tested earlier. All of this is very suggestive. Newborn infants have very impressive face recognition abilities, but it's ultimately a little bit unresolved. You could tell a story about generic shape perception abilities that can account for all of this if you try hard. You got to make a whole bunch of assumptions to get it to work, but it's, we, we, can't, we can't kill that hypothesis yet. Okay. All right. What happens after that? Um, I'm taking way too long, so I'm going to skip over some stuff very briefly and just say um, many people have been doing this enterprise of asking which of these kind of signature properties of the face system measured behaviorally are present at which age. This is a big table across lots of studies all different kinds of signatures of the face system across ages. But the simple statement is that every kind of qualitative hallmark of the face system that has been tested uh, is present in infants and young kids at the earliest age it has ever been tested. That's always by age four. All of these qualitative signatures are present by age four, but many of them are present, as you just saw, as early as the first day of life. 